I'm going to ask you to you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. We're going, we are going to uh, we're going to put this on the screen for you as well so that you at home can read along with us if you don't have your Bible with you. If you have your Bible, just get it down so you can mark it up. You say, well, my Bible's too good to mark up. Then get you another one because you need to mark that Bible up. That's the greatest thing to go back through your Bible and see the notes that you've made. The Bible says this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence, that's disease. He will cover you with his feathers under his wings. You'll find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague, the pandemic that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent because he loves me, says the Lord. I will rescue him. I will protect him or her. And he or she acknowledges my name. He will call upon me. I will answer him, her. I will be with them in trouble. I will deliver them and honor them. And with long life will I satisfy them and show them my salvation. Hallelujah. That's a great word all by itself, isn't it? What I will tell you is that I was supposed to be in Clovis, New Mexico, on this Sunday morning, speaking to a wonderful church that is pastored by a dear friend of mine. And instead, yesterday, the Lord spoke to me so clearly because of what has happened in the world over the last week. And the panic, the fear, and all that has taken place that we never thought could take place. Because of the unsettledness all around, I turned to the pastor and I said, Pastor David, uh, I feel, because of everything that's happened, that you need to speak on Sunday morning to your people. They need to hear from Dad. And I said, I know my people also need to hear from Dad. So I'm going to go back to Shreveport and I am going to speak on Sunday morning to my flock, to those that are and have been under my covering for all of these years. You see, sometimes it takes the voice of dad to just settle you down and to give you confidence. And when you're in a crisis, it's not that dad has any more to say than anybody else. It's just that for some reason, when dad says it, it's the truth and it's going to come to pass. And that's what I hope you will understand today, that I've come here as not only a father in this house, or really a grandfather in this house, but I have come here as the voice of the Father. And I believe that our Father God is going to speak comfort and assurance and direction to our lives. Amen? Now what I will tell you is this, is that once God begins to work in our lives, 
and he begins to move in our lives in a time of, of crises or inconvenience or, or threat, then at that point, we begin to change our thinking. Our, our point of view is different. When somebody asks us, how are you doing? We don't just flippantly say we're okay. We really are okay. In fact, we're better than okay. We're great because the Father, Father God, has spoken to us. Amen. I want to speak to you for the next few minutes on the subject this morning of coronavirus. What do we do now? Coronavirus. What do we do now? Now, the first thing I want to do this morning is just to make a few observations. Here's the first one. This is an unprecedented season in our lives. Do you agree? I mean, it's amazing. Conferences, church service. You notice I was at a men's conference in Rio Dosa, New Mexico, two days ago. Dan Newman was there with me. And we were there for that great conference. It's been going on for 26 years. 1,600 men were coming from a six-state region to this conference. It was going to be powerful. God was going to change men's lives. And a couple of hours before the conference was the kickoff, the sheriff of the county showed up and said, sorry, you're going to have to shut down. We had already checked into our hotels. We were already ready to go. The men had already gathered, and it was over just like that. That's unprecedented. Do you agree? Church services have been shut down. Concerts, public events of every description are being canceled. Universities have sent students home. I was in the airport yesterday, and the airport was jammed with kids. I've never seen that many college students at one time in the airport in my life. It was wall-to-wall students going home. The hallowed halls of colleges like Michigan and LSU, Notre Dame, and others have become eerily empty in just 48 hours. I mean, this is unprecedented. The NBA, professional soccer, Major League Baseball, all shutting down. The NCAA basketball championship is canceled. Listen to this. For the first time, they won't be playing since 1939. There will be no college World Series. We don't even know if the major leagues are going to be able to really kick back in. The stock market is now reeling from the shock of what happened. An economy that was setting records daily now seems to be on life support. There is a shortage of goods, and especially toilet paper. Has anybody figured that one out yet? There are videos of people fighting over toilet paper. Uh, the coronavirus has somehow affected people in a way that they need to go find toilet paper. And people are getting sick, of course. The, the worst part of this thing is, is the illness, those that really are contracting the virus and they're getting sick and many are dying from this strange new virus and as of now there's there's no cure I mean this is unprecedented and here's the second observation fear has gripped people's hearts have you ever seen people as afraid as they are right now in fact Dan Newman uh, told me he said I know why that there's a shortage of toilet paper. I said, why? He said, well, it's the fear people have. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, he said, if you have a crowd of 100 people, and he said, one sneezes, he said, 99 poop their pants. <laughs> I don't know if that's the explanation or not. But what I can tell you is fear, fear has gripped the hearts of people. It's true. People are afraid. I've never seen anything like Luke 21, 26. Men's hearts failing them from fear. And the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Now, here's the third observation. Biblically, this is a warning of things to come. It is a warning of things to come. Now, the book of Revelation is primarily about things to come. Things which shall be hereafter or events that would come after the Apostle John's era. 
In Revelation 6, 1 through 8, God inspired John to discuss the seven seals. Most of you are familiar with those passages that lead up to Jesus Christ's second coming. And the first four seals are commonly called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. These horsemen symbolize the end time culmination of the most devastating woes that have ever been endured by mankind because of man's rebellion, of course, against his creator. And in his description of the fourth horse and its rider, this is what John writes. I looked and there was a pale green horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades followed him. This symbolizes catastrophic disease and epidemics. The passage states that along with the other three riders, which represent religious deception, war, and famine, the anemic horseman on horse number four represents disease that will literally end up killing the fourth part of the earth. Now with today's population of 7.8 billion people, that death toll would come to nearly 2 billion people. You say, do you think that is what this is? I have no idea. But what I will tell you is this. This is a warning of things to come. This should be the biggest wake-up call for the church of Jesus Christ, not to mention a lost world. Now, Revelation is not the only book in the Bible to warn us about an end-time return of disease outbreaks. Jesus Christ himself said pandemics of pestilence would happen before his return. This is what he said. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be pestilence in divers or unusual places. And what that's talking about is disease. There will be unusual strains of disease. Pestilence in this context means disease outbreaks on a massive scale. Now, those of you that are tuned in for comfort, I know that you're not being comforted yet. Hold on. It's going to get a lot better. I'm telling you, we're just going to set the stage. What we're going to do is set up all the devil's toy soldiers, and then we're going to knock them down. How about that? Now, I have always avoided conspiracy theorists. You know, I've, I've had friends that felt everything was a conspiracy. Ha! Huh. Did you see that label on the toothpaste? Antichrist. That's Antichrist toothpaste. Did, did, have, have, you, have you noticed? Have you noticed the dollar bill? You see that eye looking at you right there? You know what that means? That's it. It's 666. It's, well, you know, a lot of that may be true. Because here's the thing. I, I feel rebuked right now in this season. I feel that maybe I should have listened to some of my crazy friends more. Maybe they had something going on. Maybe they knew something. And here's the reason why. Because when you begin to talk about in 48 hours the ability to stop every church service in America and the world wherever there's governance. Folks, it was sobering for me. I mean, this has been eye-opening from a point of view that everything that we see in the book of Revelation and have been expecting as far as the Antichrist spirit moving against the church of Jesus Christ could happen and it could happen in a week. Today, orders have been handed down and across America and church meetings are not happening in their sanctuaries. We are not meeting here because we're, we're honoring our government and thank God this is not anything against the church. That's not what's happening now. I'm just saying in the wrong hands Everything is already set up to manipulate the church and to make sure that it is placed in a position to be persecuted or shut down. I, it's, it's sobering. Those are my observations. We're done with those. Now let's go to good news. 
Here are my declarations. Number one, we will not succumb to fear. I said we will not succumb to fear. Every dream that anyone has ever had throughout scriptural history has come with a set of instructions that began like this. Fear not. And the second phrase has always been, for I am with you. What I will tell you is this, is that the God who was with Moses when he walked in and shut Pharaoh down is with you. What I will tell you is the God who protected all of the children of Israel and their houses because they put blood on the doorpost and the angel of death did not touch them. He is with you. I want to tell you that the God that was with the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace is with you. I want to tell you that the God that was with Daniel in the lion's den is with you. I want to tell you that the God who was with the apostles of the first generation when they were being martyred and they were being persecuted is with you. And this is what they said. They said, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep to the slaughter. Yea, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. All I'm telling you folks is we will not succumb to fear. I don't care how widespread this virus gets. I don't care if it's down the block now. I don't care if it begins to manifest itself in places that nobody ever expected it. We have got to determine while the disease may be real, fear will not add any kind of disadvantage to our lives. We are believers to the core. Everything in us believes because He has transformed our lives, filled us with His power, healed our past. He is with us and we will not be afraid. Hallelujah. You say, Pastor, I can't believe you yelling me in my home. <laughs> I want you to understand, we will not succumb to fear. Here's the second thing. We have a covenant that covers coronavirus. You ever had a contract, insurance contract? And something bad happens at your house. And you, you're just feeling so good because you got insurance, right? And the guy comes, the little guy comes with the little bitty eyes. And he sits in your house. And, you know, he's, he, and he's looking at the fine print, which you never read. And you're saying, you know, I had this thing happen in my house. And, you know, it's just, just amazing because, you know, the ceiling just, it just fell out there. And, you know, I didn't do anything to cause it. Just felt just right over there in the kitchen. Just, just fell out there, and so we just want to make sure we get that covered by insurance. And he goes, "Oh, <laughs> oh, this this contract doesn't follow. Does it? Doesn't cover? Is this a pink kitchen? Oh, it doesn't cover pink kitchens in the corner of the ceiling. Now, if it had been over there in the hall, we could have covered it." Sorry, it's just, you know, it's just ridiculous, right? I mean, it really is. It's not that ridiculous because that's not the way it happens. But all I can tell you is it's ridiculous when you find out what's not in the contract. Anybody with me? Most of you are young people that are gathered here. And so you haven't had to deal with that yet. But what I can tell you is, is insurance is important as long as you know what it covers. If it's in the contract and you can point to it, then you're going to be okay. Now, now, here's what I want you to understand. Is that we have a covenant that covers coronavirus. Hallelujah. We have a covenant with God and we are covered. A lot of people get confused about the Bible because they want to know, well, what's enforced now and what's not enforced what you have to understand is the Bible is not a divided book. It's an old covenant and a new covenant with one God. 
And if anything ever came out of his mouth, it's important to him. Now, it may not be practiced exactly as it was always practiced by those that looked sometimes at what came out of his mouth as more important than whose mouth it was coming out of. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I'm talking about you can get sidetracked with the rules and never meet the life giver. And so, for instance, it will always be important to God that you take one day a week and rest. Why? Because that's not a law, that's a value. That came out of his heart. That came out of his mouth. It's important that you take a day and that you rest. That is not the curse of the law. That's a blessing of the law. Those two things are different. Amen? And so when God first began to have a people, He began to walk them through a wilderness. And He wanted to make sure that He spoke things over Him out of His own heart that they would always remember and that they could depend on. He wanted to make sure that they knew what was in the contract. And so what I will tell you is that He was one day speaking to his people and he wanted them to understand that if they would obey him and trust him and walk with him and it says it right here none of these diseases of the Egyptians will come upon you now here's what I can tell you you have a covenant with God your house is under a covenant. Your health is under a covenant. Your future is under a covenant. Now, if you don't believe it and enter into it, then you're just going to leave it laying on the table. The kitchen ceiling's never going to get fixed because you're never going to point out what's in the covenant. But I can tell you when you have a covenant and you know you have a covenant with God, and when he has spoken it out of his heart, and it is his will for you, you can depend on him always keeping his word. You say, where is coronavirus in the covenant? Well, it's over in the New Testament now. That's the latest update of the covenant. And this is what it says. By his stripes we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. Here's my third declaration. When the world is in chaos, the church is in control. We are not to worry like the world. We are not to react like the world. We're not to speak doubt like the world. We're not to panic like the world. Because when the world is in chaos, the church is in control. And we as members of the church of Jesus Christ have a responsibility to God to look back on this season and know that we fought a good fight and we kept the faith and that we were exemplary in the way that we handle this. I talked to a man who was going through a very difficult time recently and I said, this is what you've got to do. You've got to right now project yourself into the future when this is all over. And you've got to ask yourself, when you are standing there, how do you want to have handled this season of crises? Now this will change your life if you'll, if you'll grasp what I'm saying. I said, I want you to project yourself into the future and I want you to look back over your shoulder standing there in the future and ask yourself, how, when I am standing there, do I want to have walked through this season? It's kind of like Des. He wanted to go to the haunted house at the fair. And he wanted to, you know, that you go through on these little cars. He says, I want to go through. I want, to, I want you to go with me, Dad. I, want you. I said, son, it's going to be scary. I, I know. I, I, got, I, I can do it. Just a little tyke. 
probably, you know, four years old, five years old, whatever. You had to go. You had to go. And so I knew that, you know, it was not a big deal at the fair. And so I, I got in the little car with him. And so we, as soon as it gets dark and this cardboard, honestly cardboard, ghost flies up. I mean, it's the most fake looking thing you've ever seen in your life. He is in hysterics. Screaming, crying, holding on to me. I want out, I want out, I want out. We finally got to the end. He cried all the way. Got to the end. And it was in the, in the sunshine now, the daylight, and looking around. He looked at me and he said, I didn't cry at all, did I? That's, that's the way some of us are, you know? We, we're, the, we're the biggest crybabies through the trial. And then we want to tell everybody else how God got us through it. How we just walked through it with great hallelujah and faith. And I'll tell you how I overcome these trials. Let me just say something to you. It's important how you walk through difficult times. But you need to decide on the front end how you're going to walk through this trial. Now, what I'm going to ask you is this. What I want to ask you is this. Are you going to, run, are you going to walk through this, folks, just like your neighbors? Are you going to have the same conversations as your Aunt Gladys who's terrified and giving you the latest stats of how many people are dying I mean is, is that are you going to get into that is that is that the way you're going to handle it because the fact is when the world is in chaos the church should be in control you have got to learn to look into people's eyes during this season and say let me tell you something God's in control and everything's going to be all right You've got to be able to look into their eyes and say, don't worry. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. It's going to be all right. That when somebody's terrified, wide around the mouth, not knowing what to do, just shaking, trembling, that you're able to take their hand and say, hey, may I please just pray for you? May I just please pray for you and agree with you? It's not God's will that you be this upset. This is not a time when we are to be in chaos. The church is to be in control during this time. And here's the fourth observation. Here's the fourth declaration. This season of chaos will be our time of increase. It will be our time of increase. While the stock market plunges, the, uh, the worth of what is happening in the kingdom of God is going to soar. I'm just saying... We are going to have great increase during this time of chaos. And, and folks, please, please hear me. God is going to increase and bless you. Some of you are worried about the stock market. Well, all you need to do is to take it to the Lord and talk to Him about it. Say, Lord God, I've lost this in the market. I need this to be made up somewhere because... This is something that has been devoured by the enemy. And, you know, the word says in Joel chapter 2 that, that you're going to restore what the, the things of this world have, have consumed and that they have eaten up. And so you're going to be the one who brings it back and prospers me and blesses me. See, folks, we've got to walk in faith because this season of chaos has got to be our time of increase. And last of all, I want to give you two invitations, okay? Two invitations. Here's the first one. I want to invite all of you to step up during this time in answer to the attack of the enemy on the church of Jesus Christ and on the lives of people in this world. I want you to step up to a new level of commitment as a member of the Lord's church. Yesterday, I had the privilege of talking to the staff by Skype from the um, Lubbock Airport. And how I love our pastoral staff. And what I said to them is this. I said, this season is going to teach us to be better pastors than we have ever been. Now, let me say this to all of you that are watching online. We're going to take better care of you during this season than we ever have in all of our time together. We're going to check on you. We're going to make sure we have your prayer request. We're going to be praying for you. 
God is going to bless your home. He's going to bless your children. He's going to bless your business. He's going to bless everything in your life as we pastors join our faith with yours. And so what we want you to do is that we want to invite you to step up to a new level of commitment as a member of the Lord's Church. I'm going to invite you to step up your giving just because this is a hard time. I'm going to ask you to step up your level of prayer and Bible study. Many of you are confined at home and you are having to work from home. Well, here's the thing that God can do because of this, what we call a disadvantage. He can give you time with your family that is such quality time. It will heal a bunch of stuff that has needed healing for a long, long time. You know, you and your wife actually might get to know each other again. Wouldn't that be amazing? And while you're there, you need to get your Bible open. And you need to get back into some real Bible study. You've been hungry for that. Now you're going to get a chance to do that. You need to get back on your prayer bones. You need to increase your prayer life and your time with the Lord. You, you need to begin to believe again for the dreams that were in your heart that have faded with time and with circumstance. I invite you to go to a whole new level in your commitment as a member of the Lord's church. This is what I'm praying. I'm praying for miracle of miracles. I'm praying that on the very first day that we're able to meet back here together, that we will have the largest attendance that we've had in 10 years. I'm believing that God is going to turn this thing on the enemy in just that dramatic of fashion. And here's my last invitation, and I want you to hear it. I invite you to go to a new level of relationship with Jesus in wake of this crisis. To go to a new relationship with Jesus. There are certain things that automatically happen, especially to believers, when we face a time like this. And one is introspection. We just naturally begin to look in our hearts, don't we? We want to, first of all, find out if we're ready to die. You say, well, that's morbid. No, not really. Because you're not really ready to live until you're ready to die. And so the question I want to ask you right now is this. With everything that is swirling around you, with fear that hangs heavy in the air, with the threat of a disease that can literally take your life in 17 to 20 days. With all of that happening around us, all of the fear, the feeling of unsettledness and unrest, chaos, confusion. I want to ask you, are you where you want to be with the Lord Jesus? Let me put it this way. Do you want to go to heaven like you are? Do you want to face God like you are? Because you see, everybody's going to face the Lord, everybody. And so I would ask you, do you want to stand for, before God just like this? Is that good enough? Are you ready to stand before God? Because if you're not ready to stand before God, then this, this horrible thing that has happened worldwide could be the very best thing that ever happened to you personally to get you to simply ask the right questions for the first time in a long, long time. Those of you that are watching from home, I just want to ask you, you're maybe by yourself there, maybe you're with friends and family. Are you where you want to be when you stand before God? If you were called into eternity during the next weeks, would you be able to say, I was exactly where I wanted to be in my heart to stand before God? Because you see, this morning, the most important thing in the world is that you have your name written in the book of life, that you are ready to stand before God. There's a very convicting scripture that as a kid used to just drive into my knees. 
seeing that all of these things will be dissolved, what manner of person should you be? What manner of person should you be? Here's the good news. You can't make yourself that kind of person. But we have a God who through the power of the cross has already paid the price to make you exactly what he demands. So right now, this is what I'm going to ask. If you right now aren't where you need to be with Jesus, and I'm going to pray this prayer, and as you're watching at home or wherever you are, I want you to pray this prayer with me, and we're going to claim a brand new beginning in relationship with Jesus. I want every one of you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I love you, Lord. I believe in you. You are the only Lord, the only Savior of the world. But I know I've been living my own way, doing my own thing lately. My thoughts don't please you. My actions don't please you. My lifestyle doesn't please you. And I'm sorry. And I have been convicted to get my life right with you. And I know I can't scrub up and get clean on my own. It is only your blood that washes me and makes me clean. So right now, I ask you, cleanse me, forgive me, and I pray that you will empower me to be everything I need to be for your glory. In Jesus' name. Now I'm going to stretch my hand out, and I'm going to pray for you, dear family members, dear friends. I want to pray that God will bless you during this time. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you'll bless every family in this church. I pray you'll bless their children. I pray you'll bless their marriage. I pray, oh God, that you will bless them in everything that they touch and everything that they do. I ask, oh God, that you'll calm the storm and the chaos in homes that has limited them and kept them from being all that you've called them to be. I pray that the presence of the Holy Spirit during this time of quarantine, during this time of adjustment because of this disease. I pray, Lord God, that it will be turned for their good. And I pray, Lord, that their homes will become sweeter in your presence. And I pray that their marriages will become more sovereign, solid, and blessed. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless their children. And Lord, even as they do their homework and their classwork from home, I ask, oh God, that the grades will get better. I ask that everything that these kingdom homes desire Lord, will be granted in Jesus' name. I pray, oh God, that you will bless them with all manner of spiritual blessings. And I pray that every tenant, every advantage of the new covenant will be yours in Jesus' name. Amen.